Hello, and welcome to my session, Node.js, Machine Learning, Kubernetes, and Unethical Face Recognition. So the idea behind this talk came a little while ago, uh, back in the days of in-person events. Uh, and, and I was thinking about how I love to travel and how I love to go to various conferences and meet some software developers out there and, and have discussions with people. And, and, and I've met so many great people. Yet, every now and then, there's one person that, you know, just not as great a conversation. Let's put it this way. <laughs> so so I, I was talking about that with some friends and, and we were thinking, what if we could use some of those technologies that we're, we, we kind of know in order to help us build an application that would help us predict those the, the, the outcomes of those conversations? And that's the unethical part of this presentation, uh, which I will jump in in just a few minutes. So but before I get started, let me just uh, introduce myself. So hi, my name is Joel. I work as a developer advocate for Red Hat OpenShift, which is a Kubernetes distribution by Red Hat. Uh, I live in Ottawa, Canada. And if you ever want to get in touch with me, Twitter is always, always, always the best way. So that's Joel with two underscores, Lord. It's always the, the best way to get in touch with me. Uh, I, I watch my Twitter stream all the time, and I usually answer really quickly if you ever have any questions. So feel free to reach out. Um, but let's just jump into our topic at hand. So what did I want to build? So I wanted to build an application. I was kind of thinking, and, and that was just going through my head. And I was like, okay, well, let's, what could I do? So first of all, I would need some sort of public data. I need to, to be able to map uh, names and faces so I can kind of start recognizing people. And then I, I, I would need some sort of way to detect their face so I could, I could map that and match that with a name and, and then be able to, to score. So mapping that, that image and, and something where I, could, where I could start scoring people and de determining and, and helping me predicting uh, if I can actually, you know, have a good conversation or not. And then I needed to deploy all of those things. Now, I'm a software developer. That's what I've been doing for years now, and, and, and I love writing software. And I'm one of those software developers who used to just, you know, write code and just ship it to the deployment team or system administrators and, and let them take care of it. Uh, but for this application, I really wanted to, you know, get my hands dirty and, and try to explore a little bit um, Kubernetes and, and other technologies. So uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about that. It turns out that it was actually a lot of fun to, to play with that part as well. So let's let's start with my first hurdle that I, I came with. Um, I, I was thinking of of you know finding all, s some sort of, of data source where I, I could you know get people's face and match that with a name or uh, some sort of identifier, and then being able to you know find other sort of information about people and and all of that would need to be public. And I was like, yeah, no, that's not gonna work because nobody's gonna put all of that data publicly, right? <laughs> No, social media has come to the rescue. Twitter, Twitter is a great source of public data. In there, you can find profile pictures, you can do sentiment analysis, you can get information about followers and, and a lot of different things. And most importantly, they have an API that you can use. So that's what I decided to use. So I'm a JavaScript developer, so I decided to use npm install to install the node module that will help me with the Twitter API. So that's what I did here. Um, and once I had this API installed, then I was able to just pass in my, my keys and I'm able to do uh, some of the rest calls that are available on developers.twitter.com. So you can take a look at the documentation. It's pretty well, well made. Um, there's just a few things where um, some of the terminology is a little bit, um, well, they, they, it's the original API, right? So they use terms like um, uh, statuses instead of tweets, uh, just because tweets didn't exist when Twitter first rolled the API. Um, but anyways, you, you can get some information like this. You can get the list of followers. Um, there's some rate limits and there's a, a limit of how many records they will return for each call as well. So that, those are things that you need to keep in mind. But really the interesting part about this API is that you can actually create streams. So in this case, I'm creating a stream. And, and I mean, you could technically listen to all the tweets, uh, but that's a lot of information to process. So I needed to narrow it down to something. What I decided to use as a filter was just my list of followers. So you can see here that I'm starting by getting all of my follower IDs. And then I use that as my filter uh, just to get any, any tweets that have anything to do with any of my followers. So that could be uh, tweets by or tweets uh, to or replies or mentions or anything that has to do with my followers. And then every time that, that there's one of those tweets that comes in, well, this uh, callback right here is actually triggered and I can get the information from the tweet. 
so this is actually my, my slide is actually connected to Twitter in real time right now. So you can see I've got some incoming tweets. I'm kind of relying on Twitter right now. But there, there you go. So it's not actually not too bad. Um, and you can see that I have, well, the, the uh, profile picture as well as the latest tweet from, from that person. So I, I already have some sort of information where I can actually get started to work with. One other thing that I mentioned, you have to be careful if you want to play with the Twitter API. It's a great API. It's a lot of fun to, to work with, but they have a rate limit. So you'll have to keep that in mind. Uh, it's limited to about 900 calls per 15 minutes. Uh, so that's pretty much a one per second. So you might need or you'll most likely need to throttle your calls. And one thing that really helped me was to cache information. So I was trying to you know, fetch all the information every time I restarted the application and, and I was hitting that rate limit constantly. Um, so what I ended up doing was just caching that information in a database so I didn't have to uh, download all of it again. All right, so I have your face. Uh, I've got a profile picture. I've got your tweets, so some sort of information. I've got, of course, your Twitter handle as well. So now what? Now what can I do with that? Well, now's the time to start rating people. That was my ultimate goal, right? My evil, unethical goal was to, to start scoring people. Uh, so now I have some information. I, I can actually start... Um, rating the rating the people so or or predicting um, the type of conversation that I'm gonna get. So in order to check if you are you know worthy of my time, if, if we should have a conversation or not, uh, well, one, first of all, you would need to be one of my followers. That is a, a technical issue that you know I, I just need to filter on something, um, and I decide that would be my filter. Now I, I decide to check if you have a good following yourself, if you follow other people as well, that you know would be a sign that you might have or potentially have a, a broad range of opinions. And, and, and one of the things that was really important for me was make sure that your tweets are generally positive. Because if I see you in a, con in, in a conference, I, you know, I want us to have a positive conversation essentially. So that was an important point as well. So in order to help me with all of that, I've used machine learning, which is... <laughs> probably the best image to describe machine learning. Um, so machine learning is, is a study of computer algorithms that improve automatically through experience. It is seen as a subset of artificial intelligence. And it builds a mathematical model based on sample data known as training data in order to predict or, or make decisions without being explicitly programmed to do so. So basically you have to take some data, transform that into numbers, and then you know get something out of it. So I wanted to use that to do face recognition and, and start, um, you know, using some, some sort of machine learning. And um, I figured, you know, that's fine. There's, there's a, a tensorflow.js library that, that exists, and I can just jump in and start building my models. Now, it turns out that TensorFlow is not as easy as I initially thought. <laughs> so that was my second hurdle, hurdle there. Uh, I, it, it, yeah. There's a title called data scientist, and there's a reason for that. Those people are really, really smart um, and way smarter than I am, or at least they have much more knowledge of data science than I do. So that didn't really work out. Um, I found out that you know trying to train a model is, is hard, it's complex. Um, there are some cloud solutions that are available, so you can use some cloud services to help you with that. Uh, but but it's it costs a lot of money. I, I, I mean, each call is relatively cheap, but you, you've got to do a lot of those calls in order to get some some real data, and and, uh, and yeah, you'll you'll eventually run out of, of free credits. You know, when you sign up for those one hundred dollars uh, credits, it goes really really fast when you're trying to do that. But uh, what I ended up finding now, though, is that there exists some pre-trained models. And that was actually a very good solution for me. So I stumbled on this library called faceapi.js, which is just a bunch of APIs to do uh, manipulation with face detection and so on. And they include some pre-trained models. So uh, I immediately started playing around with it. And you can see here that you now I was sitting in front of my computer, decided to take a picture, see if it can actually do a face detection. And there you go, you have it. It detects my face with 99% accuracy. So that's pretty good. Um, so I decided to try to, you know, fool the algorithm a little bit and hide in a corner just to see. And I see 83%. Um, and that one was much faster because it, it loaded the model the first time. So that's why the first time took a little, just a little longer. Um, and I decided to, you know, hide in another corner, remove my glasses just to fool the, uh, the AI. Or, um, yeah, of course, without 
glasses, it's easier to detect the face. But <laughs> you know, I used to see my face with, with glasses, so I thought that would be a good catch. But no, uh, could, couldn't fool the uh, the machine learning algorithms there. Uh, so it does it does face detection and it does it really really well. The other thing that it does is face landmarks, and that is very important. That's the first step in uh, in order to get face recognition. So that what what the algorithm will try to do here is that it will kind of try to put your face as if it was looking in front of the camera, and then it will try to map 68 data points in your face. Uh, there are algorithms that take more than 68 points, but this is the one that I, I, I was using. Um, and you can see here that it maps your eyebrows, it maps the, the nose bridge, it maps the jawline. Um, and we don't see it really well because it's kind of turned, but if I take that first picture, you really see it here. You really see the eyes, the jawline um, on, on this picture. So now that I have those, those face landmarks, I knew that I was you know, on a good path to do face recognition because using those landmarks and the ratios between those points, uh, those are called face descriptors, and I can use that in order to do face recognition. Fun fact, it also does face expression, which uh, you know I thought was funny. So of course I decided to do some funny faces. Uh, so in here I'm kind of a mix of angry and surprised. Um, so yeah, so it's it's a lot of fun. It's a, it's a nice little library that you can use, uh, and it's not too complex either to use. Uh, and fun thing about it is that you can both use it in uh, Node.js, uh, so that import face API from face API.js is in Node.js, or you can use it directly in your browser, as I'm doing in my slides here, using a script tag. Once you have the loaded the library, you can just load your models, which are included in the Git repo. So in this case, I'm loading the SSD mobile net v1 model, and I'm loading the face landmark case uh, landmark 68 net uh, model as well, which will do the face landmarks. And once I have those models loaded, what I need to do is to load the image inside a canvas, and then I can use this uh, this this um, this library face API to detect all faces with the face landmarks and face descriptors on that canvas. Also, fun thing that it does is that it actually has some draw methods where you can directly draw on the canvas, just as I did in my previous examples. If you want to use it in Node.js, you can use the exact same code. So that's very convenient. So I was able to you know, explore a little bit in my browser, get a visual sense of what's happening. But then I was able to transport that, that code very easily into my Node.js application. In order to do that, you just need to install Node Canvas, which is a virtual canvas that can be used in Node.js applications. And then you can monkey patch uh, using the Canvas image and image data objects that you just created. But what about face recognition, right? So far, I can detect a face. I can detect expressions if I need to, not that I've used it. But I wanted to do face recognition. That was my ultimate goal, right? I want to make sure that I can recognize someone and map them to their Twitter profile. So in here, you can see that I've trained it with one image, and I can put in an image, and it can actually detect that image, right? How cool is that? Uh, well, <laughs> if you're paying attention, you might notice that, well, it's the same image, so it's got to make sense that it worked, right? But, <laughs> but if I tried with one of those other images, um, let's try that one, actually. Well, there you go. It can actually detect myself there. Um, so I was pretty impressed with that, pretty happy with that. Um, and I figured, well, you know, I'm wearing the same T-shirt. It's kind of the same background. So let's let's try a completely different image or different different angle, something completely different. And let's try to fool it with two faces. And turns out that it can still detect me right there. This other uh, person right there is my lovely wife with me. So let's see if we can actually add some more data to Face API to see if we can detect her as well. So in here, I can add some more training data. So just a more images of myself. I've added this image of my wife here, um, and, and it's it's a little bit small right here, so you can't really see it, but she's actually wearing sunglasses in there. So let's, let's give that a try. So we'll run the same image again, and there you have it. So you can now detect Joel and Natasha on that image with a pretty good accuracy right there. All right, so how do you do the face recognition? You're still using faceapi.js, Basically, what you're doing is that you're extracting those face descriptors from uh, using pretty much the same code as I did earlier. Um, and then you associate those face descriptors with some labels. So you're saying, well, label Joel is matching with, or has this collection of face descriptors. And you can just put in an array there and build that array of labeled face descriptors. Once you have that, you can use the face matcher which you will pass the labeled face descriptor and how uh, accurate you want it to be. And then you can just try to find the best match and it will return the picture, which you can then draw on the canvas once again. 
All right, so they have a great playground. They've got a lot of stuff. You can take a look, faceapi.js. Um, in here, you can you know even explore with different uh, different models. So you saw how the SSD mobile net, it, it took just a second to, to load that progress bar. You could use something like the tiny phase detector, which is much faster, blazing fast, but you know not as accurate. Uh, so it really depends on your use case. All right, so I can now do face recognition with a single reference point. That was very important because all the information that I have about you is your Twitter profile picture. Uh, but of course, I'm assuming that your um, Twitter profile picture is an actual picture of yourself and that you're not wearing a mask or something covering your face now. But that was pretty cool. I'm, I'm on the right track. I'm almost, almost able to uh, start, start judging you and start scoring you. But, but I wanted more. I wanted more machine learning. I also wanted to do sentiment analysis. Uh, as I mentioned, I want to make sure that your tweets are generally positive. So uh, sentiment analysis is a way to determine whether a piece of writing is positive or negative, basically. Um, so I've used npm install sentiment. And now I'm able to just use this library. So it will return me a score between plus five and minus five based on whether uh, the, the, the sentence is generally positive or, or the tweet is generally positive or negative. Basically, it will give a score to each one of those words. Um, positive, for example, will be scored something like five. And this and is a score guard. There's, those are neutral words, so you can assume that they, they would be scored zeros. And then you just take the average out of those, uh, which is 1.33, uh, 1.66. Anyways, <laughs> I'll let you do the math. Um, and this one here, negative, uh, is a very negative. So let's say it's minus five. And then we've got two words, something being neutral. So we've got a minus 2.5 here. So you can get a, a rating all of those. And that's a number that you can actually use um, to, to start you know, scoring or do some machine learning with. So I've applied that to uh, my slide with the, um, the Twitter feed right there. So you can kind of see that this one has a, a reddish shade uh, because it scored minus 11. Um, and this one is minus, uh, minus dot 15, uh, pl uh, plus 0.15. So you can see that it was, you know, it's a, it's a little bit greenish there. So based on, you know, the, the, uh, the, how a negative or positive the tweet is, we can actually colorize and, and do some, some stuff with that. All right. So, so far I've got public data. I've got your face. I've got your tweets. Now what? Now's the time to connect everything together and actually build that application, right? So the first thing that I needed was to, I had all those little samples and I just, I didn't want to rewrite the whole thing as one big application. So I figured I want to use microservices. So I, I'll use Node.js containers to help me with that. Uh, now I'll need a way to, for each one of them to communicate with, you, with each other. Um, initially I was, I was trying to do REST APIs, that didn't work out. Uh, so I, I've turned to messaging queues. I've used RabbitMQ there. Um, I needed to cache some information, store some information, so I've used a database. Uh, I've used MongoDB for that, and then I needed to connect everything together, get all those, those containers to talk to each other, and I've used Kubernetes, uh, or more specifically, OpenShift for that part. So microservices really helped me out there. Um, I didn't have to rebuild my whole application. I was able, all those little snippets that I had that were kind of working, all those little proof of concepts that I had built, they, I, I didn't need to rewrite all of them. So I was able to reuse them directly inside different containers. If you want to learn about containers, I have a talk called Containerization for Software Developers. I'll link to it at the end. Um, but just in a nutshell, containers is a standard unit of software that packages up code and all of its dependencies so the application runs quickly and reliably from one environment to another. So what that means is that basically you're shipping your whole application. So not only your JavaScript files, but all the runtimes that are needed, all the configuration that is needed. So it's basically like shipping your laptop. Uh, so you can easily you know, deploy that into any environment. Um, it's also a disposable unit. They're also self-contained. Um, so they're, they, you know, they're not supposed to talk to each other. Uh, so node containers, how to run them, you would uh, use the, a tool such as Docker, Docker run. Uh, in this case, I'm just starting a container, mapping some files on my local system inside the container, and then using the Node.js, uh, uh, Node 14 uh, image right here. If you want to use a database, say you want to use a MongoDB, well, you can also use a container in the same, pretty much in the same way. So Docker run, once again, I am passing environment variables to define how I want my, my server to be set up. So in this case, my root username will be admin and my root password is 12345, which is not the password I usually use, just so that we're on the same page. <laughs> and then I can mount a volume on my uh, local machine that it will map into the container as well. 
Uh, if you need an interface to manage your MongoDB, well, there's also an image for that. So there's an image for pretty much everything. And then just read the documentation and you can start those images. And it's really, really easy to have all of those servers up and running uh, with just, you know, using Docker. All right, I needed to store some information somewhere. Now I needed something flexible. I needed something JSON friendly. As you already know, I was using MongoDB for that. Um, basically what I decided to use was Mongoose as a library to connect to my Mongo, Mongo database. Um, you can create different schemas and then you're using schemas. And, and now that I have one defined, I could use something like follower.find1 and just give it some, some filters. Um, it works well, um, but it, it, it's a little bit hard to debug. There's a few uh, kinks with it. Um, looking at, uh, uh, with hindsight, uh, using the uh, MongoJS driver would have probably been a little bit easier for me. Uh, but, you know, that, that's kind of what I've used in there. All right, I needed all of my containers to talk to each other now. So that was one of the big things where I, I initially started using REST APIs. I'm used to build in, building those, you know, I just install an express server with each one of my container, but it was a mess. I was trying to figure out like all the different uh, asynchronous calls that we're doing and then one was depending on the other one on the other one and, and it would go really deep. Um, I'll show you the architecture in a few minutes, but REST APIs were not the way to go. And I was scratching my head and that was one of the parts where I was like rethinking the whole thing and then trying to figure out how am I going to do that. So I was trying to find a way to do a centralized place where everything could connect and maybe use some web sockets so I could connect everything together and and boy, that was a lot of trouble. But I, I remembered hearing about those messaging queues and I read it up and I looked it up and I was like, okay, well, what, what is a messaging queue exactly? It sounds like maybe something I could use. So a messaging queue is a form of asynchronous service to service communication used in serverless and microservices architectures. That sounds exactly like what I need, right? So messages are stored in a queue until they're processed and deleted. Each message is processed only once by a single consumer Message queues can be used and to decouple heavyweight processing to buffer or batch work and to smooth spiky workload. So that is exactly what I needed. So basically I've got a publisher, so I've got something that happens. It will send a message to the message queue and whenever it's ready, I'll have a consumer that will just pick that message up and process that message. That required some changes in the, the architecture and the way that I think about how messages are passed along, but essentially it worked out really, really well. And when I had different things, like if I, I have a service that listens to Twitter to see if I have a new follower, once it receives a message that has a new follower, it just sends a message saying, hey, got a new follower with the big profile information. And that one is consumed by a transformer service, which will just take that giant object, giant JSON object, and just reduce it to the number of fields that I need. And then it, it becomes a publisher, which sends a message to my server, which will be in charge of saving that information into my database. Now, once that server detects that there is a new face or a new uh, profile picture, it will actually send them a new message. So it becomes the publisher again, and it sends a message to be picked up by my uh, face detection algorithm. But that one is really slow. Like it takes 500, 700 milliseconds to process an image. So those messages start to stack up really, really quickly. But the nice thing, because I was using containers and messaging queues, I was able to use competing consumers. So I was able to just scale more con containers and immediately it started, you know, going faster because now I have two consumers consuming the messages. So it's going twice as fast. So to use a uh, messaging queue, you'll have a publisher and a, um, a, a, uh, a consumer. So basically to, uh, to just to connect to your uh, AMQP, uh, in this case, I'm using AMQP lib. You just create your channel and you send a message to the queue. So that's how you write the code for a publisher. And to consume those messages, well, you use pretty much the same code here. The only difference being that in this case, you're consuming messages. So this callback is triggered every time that there's a message that is available. RabbitMQ has a great getting started guide. So if you're interested in, rap in, in uh, messaging queues, definitely take a look at them. Finally, I needed to deploy all of those things. So that was my last part, um, I, and I needed to use Kubernetes for that. So if you're interested in Kubernetes, Kubernetes Kitchen, there's a talk that is available, I'll link to it at the end. Uh, basically, it's an open source system for automating deployment, scaling, and management of containerized applications. 
So what that means is that it orchestrates everything with your containers. You just tell it, I want one instance of this container running at any given time, and it will take care that it's there. Even if it crashes, it will start a new one. If you need to scale up, you can very easily spin up more or less containers. That's what I did when I needed more face detection containers. And it takes care of the networking between all of them. So if you're interested in Kubernetes, you'll have to look into pods, deployments, and services. So a pod is kind of equivalent to a container. Deployments describe how many of those pods that you want running at any given time, and a service will expose them through a network interface. So finally, this is my application. This is what I have. <laughs> There's all of that, this work uh, resumes to that. So you can see here that I I've got my Twitter service. And whenever there's a new uh, Twitter follower that comes in, it sends a message to RabbitMQ, which then sends the message to the server, as I described earlier, which sends a message to my Mongo database to save that data, also sends to my face detection algorithm, and so on. And everything is, all the communication is done through RabbitMQ right here. All right, what about a quick demo? So let me just fire this up really quickly. And there it is. So I've got this application. I could work on the UI a little bit. I'll agree to that. So I've decided to use that with some of my friends from a last conference where I went. And you can see here that it actually detected everyone and it gave them a score. So you can see here that, well, that one is not correct. So that's not Ty Albert, that's me, but I'm not one of my followers, so it makes sense. It, it took the one the closest. Uh, here you can see Jeremy, which was accurately detected. He scored an 80. That's pretty good, so I should definitely keep talking to uh, Jeremy whenever I see him at conferences. Here we've got Bailey, which he scored a 16. So I probably shouldn't spend any more time with Bailey next time I see her at a conference. And that kind of leads me to the unethical part of this application. Uh, I mean, if uh, this application clearly was built for fun, it, it had a bunch of biases, and, and you, you probably noticed them right from the start. And, and I was fully aware of that. I was just building that for fun um, and, and to experiment with different technologies. But really, if you're building machine learning algorithms, you have to be really, really careful about that. There's no, numerous cases of unconscious biases in inside algorithms and you have to be really really careful not to introduce those so get a team get other people to look at at your code get a diverse team so that you can experiment with different data uh, make sure that you you're open to uh, more than just the information that you have in front of your eyes all right so i'll leave you with those few links containerization for software developers and kubernetes kitchen my two talks if you want to learn more about containers or uh, Kubernetes, RabbitMQ, the Getting Started Guide, and Face API, the library to do the face recognition. So thank you very much for attending. All of the link and all the information can be found at this unique link, easy URL to slash unethical. Thank you for being here.